Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and I want to join with Brandy and wishing you a happy Mother's Day for all the moms out there. Really glad that you're here, and I know for many of us, this is a day of celebration and where our hearts are with you and we're celebrating with you today, and at the same time, uh, for many of us also, this can be kind of a a hurtful time because of some loss that we've experienced. I just want you to know again that our hearts are with you and are really glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. And we are in the middle of a series in James chapter 3 where he's going to spend some time uh, talking about the way that we use our words. And it's actually one of the, what I think, one of the harshest uh, passages in the New Testament. And he's just talking about you know, the, the things that we can, the way we can hurt people with our, with our words. And, you know, you start you know, reflecting on that for a little while, at least, at least I do, and I start thinking about kind of the, the different moments in my life where th- this truth kind of s- sank in with me, and there's a couple of, I would say, kind of life-altering seasons for me, and we'll just go all the way back to high school. You know, I was, I was 18, we were, we were seniors, and there was this group of friends, you know, our, our graduating class, about 200, but, and there was this group of us, you know, we, if you took all the honors classes, you essentially had the same people in all of your classes, but they were relatively small, so it was this little group of us, and we just kind of became good friends. So we had all our classes together for several years. And, um, you know, I was 18. And I don't know what, if I said, hey, what do you think Charlie was like at 18? I don't know what you think, but he was kind of a jerk. And, um, and um, we really thought we were big stuff. You know, some of us were, were athletes, like on the basketball team. We were the smartest kids in school. So we thought we were just, we thought we were just it. And we had this guy, he was a chemistry teacher, and we had him for chemistry one as uh, sophomores. And then we had him for chemistry two again, our senior year. And again, we were just we 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 had a pretty good rapport with this guy, but you know we were what we were. And um, after a while, in the middle of our senior year, um, he he looked at us and said, "You know what you guys are? You're a bunch of intellectual snobs." Now I didn't know what he meant by that. I just knew I didn't like it when he said it. And you ever had you ever had that right where somebody says something to you and like it instinctively feels true and hurtful at the same time and so the only the only thing that you can do is just like yell right and so that's what we did but like we were just so angry but we didn't really know what it meant we just knew he was trying to insult us and we were not going to have any of that from him because we were better than him dang it okay so <laughs> so then over the next couple of years it just kind of began to sink in with me what this what this guy had said and what it meant. And I began to realize, man, that, that, that is definitely who I was in high school. Verbally abusing people because I thought I was better than them. I thought I was smarter than them. Really good with words. Really quick on my feet, quick-witted. And can cut you and bring you down just like that. I'm thinking, man, I don't, I don't know that I want to be that guy. Fast forward to college, and there was this thing that happened. This isn't one story. It's kind of a a, a composite of about 14 maybe different stories because it was this kind of thing that would happen to me on repeat. I'm I'm with a friend, just me and this guy, and we're just kind of riffing together, enjoying each other, talking, and I'm I'm trying to, you know, saying a lot of funny things, trying to get him to laugh, make him like me by laughing, right? And and so then and eventually I say something maybe where I just kind of insult a mutual friend that's really funny, right? And then the next day, two days later, later that day, whatever, you're, you're, you're hanging out, and then this guy, the other guy comes up, and he said, the first guy, is like, hey, Charlie, remember yesterday when you said, and I'm like, what? And now I feel complete sense of betrayal, no ownership for the thing that I had said yesterday, right? Just complete betrayal by this guy that you would take what was a very funny thing that I said in private yesterday and repeat it to him. I intentionally didn't say it to him. I said it to you. Why are you bringing it up to him? <laughs> and, and, and I'm just like, man. That happens once. It happens twice. It happens ten times. Eventually, even me are like, man, I'm like, how do people keep betraying? Oh, wait. There's actually an easier solution to this. And it got to the point in my life where it was like the, like the, the, the worst thing that you could say to me was to come up to me and say, hey, Charlie, remember when you said. And even though I was a little slow on the uptake um, in college, uh, I made a decision that I didn't want to be that guy anymore. I didn't want to be in a situation ever again where somebody came up to me and said, Charlie, remember when you said that I would be ashamed of anything that came out. Now, I'm obviously, I'm not 
100% on that, but it was, it was a real life-altering decision for me. And you kind of put both of those things together in my late teens all the way in my early 20s. I really feel like that what God was trying to do was kind of shape me. Because it is true, I'm pretty decent with, with words and, and do good job talk word stuff, right? And, 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 it, and, I, and I have a lot of power. And I, and I had, a, had, a, had a, a question that I was going to have to answer. Like, how do, I, how do I want to do that? How do I want to use my power? How do I want to use my words? And you flash forward, and suddenly in college, I'm really studying the book of James for the first time. And he kind of encapsulates just kind of with uh, very, very precisely and, again, very sharply this problem that I don't think is exclusive to me, but it's something that we all share in the way that we kind of use our words with other people. So here we are in James chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider... What a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Happy Mother's Day. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Again, the words here and maybe the illustrations that he used are actually a little bit severe. I mean, it, it, should, it, should, it should hit us. I mean, he's not, he's not coming at this in a nice way. He's not coming at it from behind or the side. He's just coming straight at it. Restless evil. Deadly poison set on fire by the flames of hell. This is what he is saying, our tongue, our mouths, our words. This is how we would describe it. And to sum it up very simply, basically what he's saying is, is that your mouth is destructive. It has the power to destroy people. A restless evil. Your tongue, your words, your mouth, it's evil. And it gets bored if it's not being evil. It gets restless. It's getting kind of bored. What, 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 who can we poison? What can we set on fire? And, and he just uses all of this imagery to describe its overwhelming destructive power. And again, this is the thing that I began to realize about me um, you know, 25 or so years ago. That the way that I was using my words, and I, I was destroying people. I was being destructive. I was hurting. I was wounding. And this is what we do. And I think it's important for us in, in this moment to not soft sell it. To not try, I'm not going to try to, 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 to simmer down what he's saying. Uh, our words, they destroy people. It is poisonous. It is fire. There's this thing that, that, at least when I was young, I don't know if kids still say this or not, but there's a thing that you would say when you were a kid if someone tried to insult you verbally. There's this thing that you say, and it made you somehow impervious to the insult, right? A little, little jingle, if you will. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, which is, of course, perhaps the greatest lie that one kid will tell another kid. Because, in fact, give me sticks and stones. Because your body has an incredible uh, ability to heal itself physically. If I were to tell you right now, it's like, hey, remember the worst physical injury that you've ever had? Or 
and goes back. It's like, oh, I, I remember that. For me, it's when I, when, when, I, when I broke my ankle. It's like, I remember that moment, and I remember that it hurt. I remember that hurt. But I, I, still don't, I don't still feel it. Well, that's technically not true because I'm old now, and any place I've ever hurt in my whole life hurts now. But that's not what we're talking about today, right? It doesn't, I can, it doesn't like I think about it, and my ankle starts to hurt because I'm thinking about it. But if I were to say to you, can you remember something really awful that someone said to you once? If you can remember it, not only will you remember it, but you, will, you, can, you can remember that it hurt, and you can still feel it. I still feel that thing that I felt when he said that, when she said that. So I've been, I've been remembering. This is what I've been doing all this week, preparing for this message. I've been remembering some of these moments. And I can still feel it. You know what else I can feel? I, I can feel the hurt and the guilt and the shame of the things that I've said to somebody. So we say sticks and stones are the only things that can do real damage that words can't. But that's just not true. The reality of it is, is that words and the way that we use them and the way that they're used on us and the way that we've used them on others, they have, they have a, a, a more of an everlasting pain. At least they have the potential for that. And so I think that it is important for us to make sure that we understand, hey, our words are destructive. And you saying, just kidding, doesn't change that. You saying, I didn't mean that, doesn't change that. No matter what you add afterwards, you have already injected them with poison. Well, I didn't mean to inject you with poison. Well, I'm still poison. I didn't mean to light you on fire. Well, they're still on fire. I didn't mean to crush you with my words. I was just kidding when I crushed you and devastated you with my words. It still happened. And I think it's important for us to understand how destructive our mouth, our words, are. But then he goes, he got a, some, a really cool illustration thing that starts out the passage, verse 3. He's like, man, you, you, take these little, you take these little bits, this, this little bitty thing, and you put it in this giant horse, and just this little thing right here, you tie a little rope to it, and, and you can make that animal go wherever you want. Or just imagine, or this giant boat, and you got this little rudder. It can, it, can, it, can, it can make it go wherever you want. Oh, just think, man, all it takes is one little spark, and you can set an entire forest on fire. That's what your words are like. So not only are, is our mouth destructive, it has disproportional influence. Even though it is very small in size, it has an outside, outsized influence over what it can do in your life. So your mouth is destructive, and it has disproportional influence. You can ruin everything. You can undo everything that you have ever tried to accomplish simply with just a few words. And, and I remember this. As, again, I've been thinking about stories. This was not this church. This was not the church before. This was several years. I think it was about 15 years ago, maybe. Maybe 2004 when we were, we were in St. Louis, and we were, um, we were talking about the kind of church that we wanted to be. And, you know, kind of being a real uh, open, friendly church anybody could come to, whether they've been in church or not. And, and, I, and, I, and I tell this illustration. I tell this illustration about the church that I grew up in because our church had this softball team. And, and, and the softball team, you, you could play, but you had to attend at least once a month. And so we had this group of guys uh, that would attend church once a month, but only during softball season, right? Which, which is actually it's a great idea. I mean, just get them, just get them in the door. It's actually a great idea. So, and so these guys would come, and there was this one guy in particular, and he was like a superstar. And um, it was, I guess it was his Sunday of the month. I don't know how he figured it out. I don't know how, what his calendar worked. But he came. But unfortunately for him, he came a little bit late. And he was, he was wearing jeans that day. And I am telling you, a hush went over the crowd. It was stunning. And here's what I said when I was telling this story in St. Louis 15 years ago. I said, it, it, it's like he came to church with a hooker on his arm. You guys have been around me long enough now. That didn't seem to shock you at all. <laughs> but I assure you, 15 years ago, 
That was a very shocking thing to say. And what I, what I like to believe is that I said a lot of really important things and a lot of really good things in that sermon. I think it was a good message. But all that anyone ever heard was that Charlie said the word, said, said the word hooker in church. And that's all we could talk about. And I run the same risk, right? I run the same risk today here with you. You know, a 30-minute great message is, is undone by the, 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 the word hooker, right? And, and, and I think about this. I was thinking about this this week. I could undo every bit of goodwill that I have ever earned in this community and in this church and with you individually. I could devastate all of it right now with the use of just one word. If I said one word right now, and it, but it doesn't matter what context it was, it doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter how good a pastor or a friend or a communicator I have been for the last nine years, I use one word, and I'm done. You and I are done, I'm done, and, and it's over. And now you think, I wonder what the word is. <laughs> There's like five or six, aren't there? There's like five or six words, probably more than that that if I were to use them in any context, I would be done. That seems disproportional, doesn't it? He's a good guy. He's done a lot of good things, and he's got a, this great track record. And in one moment, you say one thing, and you're done. It's, it's over. And again, I think that's why we say, I, 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 we, we try to undo it. I, I, did, I, did, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't mean that. Because we recognize, we recognize that, man, that I can just, that I can, that it, it just doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't seem right. That just with one, what feels like to me, one, one slip up. But that's the reality. The reality of it is, is that in your world, you can end relationships with the use of a bad word, the wrong word the wrong sentence, the wrong thing to say. And it does not matter what all else you have done. And so our mouth is destructive, and we need to come to grips with that. We need to be sober about it and kind of wake up to that idea. And we need to recognize that no matter how many times you say just kidding, and no matter how many times you say that you didn't mean it, no matter how many times you think that or want to believe it, I mean, it has a huge ability. It has a disproportional influence on what people believe about you. And then we kind of finish with this. He's got this great illustration. I, I think it's a little bit weird, but I, but, but I like it. In, ver, in verse 7, verse seven, he says, you know, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. So, so what he's saying here is like, not only is it destructive, it has disproportional influence, it's, it's, it's all but impossible to tame. It's all but impossible. So, so what's he saying? What he's saying here is like, hey, listen, you can have bears in your Russian circus. You can stick your head in a lion's mouth, and you can take an elephant, and you can walk him around. You can take this wild horse, and you can ride him. You can make a wolf and make the wolf your best friend. You can put a tiger in the magic show, but you don't know when to shut up. You've got all this power to tame all of these wild things, every wild thing that you can imagine is being tamed or has been tamed, and you can't keep your mouth shut when you're supposed to. You always say the wrong thing at the wrong time. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with us? And again, I think this is why we just, we don't want that to be true. We want it to be true that I have the ability to control my own tongue. I have the ability to control my words. I have that ability. So that when I say something to you, and when I say it, it is clearly devastating. I can see it all over your face. I have crushed your very soul with the words that I have said. Why I immediately want to go to, I didn't mean that. 
I, I, did, I didn't mean that. I, I, I didn't mean it. Because there's no way that me, I'm a, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a specialist in communication. There's no way I would say that. That wasn't, that wasn't me. And then we begin to act and live as if though our mouth is an autonomous being that is just saying things completely and totally on its own, completely disconnected from you. I don't, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Well, Jesus actually makes it very clear where those words came, come from. He says it very clearly. He says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So unless we're just talking about a genuine, honest slip of the tongue where you say one word when you meant to say another word, the things that you say, you say them because you believe it. You say it because you feel it. You say it in that moment because in that moment you wanted to say it. You wanted to set the forest on fire. Then when you saw the forest on fire, maybe you regretted it. But it is not the same as that you did not set the forest on fire and that you didn't do it on purpose. And actually, the more that we say, I didn't mean it, I was just kidding, the more that we say that, I think it's we, we become one step further removed from the ability to tame. Whatever control that we have to be able to tame and control our own words, we, we distance ourselves from it because really this situation is out of my control. I don't know where that came from. And it would be better, it would be more honest, it would be more genuine for us to kind of take a moment and to say, hey, I am sorry that I said that. I should not have said that. I don't believe that truly I meant it, but obviously I meant it in that moment, and I regret saying it, and I'm sorry for the hurt that it caused you. That's honest. And it gets you one step closer to a, a, a realization that the hurt and the destruction that you are causing with your mouth is coming from you. You did it. You have the destructive mouth with the disproportional influence that seems almost impossible to tame. Now, I've said this before in different contexts. Anytime we come across a passage that seems to have something really harsh in it, I've said this before. We did this all throughout in a study of Romans that we did earlier this year, where it's like, and it seems like any time the Bible says something hard, there's always like a comma, comma, but, and then there's, and, and then there's something awesome. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. James, he ain't feeling it. He, um, he just says it, and you just kind of need to think about it. But here's the thing that I don't want to do. Recognizing that my words have power and reading his words have power and trying to help you understand what his words mean has power. Um... I don't want that power to be used to bring you out of here with, with a hopeless shame. And so what I want to leave you with, I want you to leave you with, with three ideas of grace. Three things that are really important for you. I think it is important, first of all, that you understand how destructive your words are. How they have been, how they are, and unless something changes, how they will continue to be. But there are three moments of grace that I think it's very important as we, again, as we feel the consequences in our own soul. One, there is nothing that you have ever said that God will not forgive you for. Nothing. And so when you remember something that you said and you remember something that you did and that overwhelming feeling of guilt and shame comes up, you speak back to it in God's spirit and you say, God has forgiven me for that and no longer has power over me. Your second bit of grace is, is that um, God uh, will heal your heart from any hurt that has been caused to you from words. The words that have devastated the most are the ones that have come from the people closest to us. And, and, and again, a lot of us can feel it. And so you remember it and you feel that overwhelming sense of shame. You feel broken by it. And again, by God's Spirit, you speak back to it. And you say, God is healing me. That moment of hurt has no influence over me and what I think and believe anymore. And finally, uh, the third piece of grace is what James says. is It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. It is, it, you, you can tame a, a horse and a bear and a tiger and a lion, but no human being 
can tame the tongue. But the Son of God can, and the Son of God will, and that's your moment of grace number three, is that God wants to bring healing and, and, and bring your words and your mouth under control where you only say the things that, uh, that are honoring. You are no longer uh, spitting out salt water and fresh water out of the same. You're no longer trying to produce two different types of fruit. You're no longer blessing God and cursing those in His likeness. You're not doing that anymore because Jesus Christ brings healing to you. And so we have a time of response like always, and I would just encourage you. I would encourage you to take a minute and make sure that you are being sober and realistic about the destruction that you have caused and maybe are still causing. Be honest about it. Don't run away from it. Don't, shy, don't be shy. Don't let shame make you afraid to confront the truth about what you're doing. But then let us fully embrace the grace that God is offering, that He is offering you fully healing from what you've done, healing from what has been done to you, and healing for the future as God is bringing your mouth under control. As always, we have response area in the back. There's communion available. You don't have to be a member here, just a follower of Jesus Christ. Our prayer team would love to pray with you if you need some encouragement and healing in that way. There's prayer candles. Pray at the cross. We have an opportunity to give. We're going to worship. But let's be honest about where we are and embrace the grace of God for the future. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for that passage. God, I thank you for the, the things that are just a little harsher than, than what I would say, a little harsher than I want to talk about. But God, that, that these, these, this is your word. This is what you had for us. And God, I thank you for James' ability to just kind of cut through it all and just say what is real. And God, I pray that we will take that, not in a shameful way, but in an honest way. And then, God, as we feel the guilt from our past and our presence, God, that we will invite your Spirit through your Son, Jesus Christ, to heal us. Heal us from what we've done. Heal us from what has been done to us. And bring healing and restoration to our mouths, God, where we don't cause this kind of pain and damage anymore. And we thank you for your Son and his death on the cross, which is the only reason any of that is possible. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.